He is on your right. He's the 3-0. He's playing Mono Black Devotion. He's playing the role of the enemy this go-round. And he's playing against Joe Russell, who's actually playing a deck that Van Meter is a little bit more known for in Green Red Monsters. Russell going to start off with an Elvish Mystic, but a little bit ironic that we see him playing this more Monsters approach and not Van Meter. Although this is, you know, closer to what you would historically associate with a Devotion list. Yeah. Full place of Nick those Burning Tree Emissary, three copies of Garrick. He's trying to go big fast. A deck that we saw have some success at the Pro Tour in Dublin at the back end of last year. Voyaging Seder going to come down here for Russell. So now the cat's got out of the bag. I believe that was Russell's Mahara's playing. top eight? Yes, it yes. was. And the deck, if you, and I, I'm sure some people haven't seen it for a little while. You see Fan is going to downfall the Voyaging Seder. It's very explosive. Yes. You have to get those Manic Sellers off the board and keep the Devotion count low. Russell misses his third land drop just past the turn back. Van Meter going to play Temple of Deceit and take a look at a Temple of Deceit on top of his deck. Let's see if he's going to leave it on top or bottom. Looks like on top is the answer. Mutavolt feeling a little frisky. Going to come into the red zone. Knock Russell down to 18. And Van Meter's going to pass the turn back. The colored mana in the situation, the red green devotion deck is not great. I believe he has four copies of Sylvan Karyatid. That's critical for assembling red mana as well. But right now, Joe just. Unable to find red mana with a handful of Domries. There is a Night Veil Spectre from Van Meter. That'll join the party. Russell, again, still looking for that red mana, unable to find a Burning Tree Emissary actually kind of plays a role in helping to filter the red mana as well. You normally think of that as just a way to play another free one, but a lot of the times in this particular deck, it actually helps towards the red mana more than anything. Yeah. Converting Burning Tree Emissary mana through Nykthos to bridge colored mana situations is a common play that you'll see. Nightfall Spectre and the Middle are going to come in the red zone. Burning Tramus here going to be revealed off of that Nightfall Spectre. Unlikely that that will get cast this game, but here's another Nightfall Spectre for Van Meter, and he'll comfortably pass the turn back as Russell draws a card, draws a Burning Tree of his own, so finally does have access to red mana. It'll be a green and red floating. Looks like we might see a Nykthos activation, potentially. And we do. Actually, just we see a Domri here. So just tapping for a colorless will Russell. See? Just pass the turn back. He just tapped Nikthos for a colorless. Oh, okay. Didn't oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah, okay. Yeah, it generates no mana, so just for a colorless. Sure. The way that he tapped it made it seem like he was going to activate yeah, it. But yeah, yeah, okay. I think it was just for clarification saying, yeah, just this just for a colorless so I can cast my Dom Ring. Yeah, that was the physical mannerisms of someone making a I am now activating Nikthos yeah. potion there, so. So Van is going to take a draw here. You see there are multiple copies of Grey Merchant in his hand, so it could be uh, could be time for some Fireballs to get unleashed here. And they'd be eight pointers, which would be pretty large. But he's going to start, it looks like, by attacking in the air. We'll see where he wants to go with these Night Field Spectres. If he wants to go after the Planeswalker or go at the life total. And for as ahead as Chris is at this point, I will tell you between Burning Tree Emissary and Nykthos, this deck definitely has the capability of exploding in one turn. I've seen... Things like an overloaded Mizium Mortar has come out of this board state. It doesn't yeah, require nowhere. Set of, yeah. Van Meter's going to play that stomping ground. There's a Grey Merchant. That's going to be for eight. Going to knock Russell down to two. Van Meter's going to go up to 28. And he can comfortably pass the turn back. For the backup Grey Merchant, so even if something like an overloaded Mortis were to happen. It's a good clean living on the right hand side. Yeah. It's really easy to play Mono Black. Okay, tough guy. Van Meter does win at game number one here. No up a game parts. over Green Red. That's, 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 you know, if you had to, you know, what's the defining powerful feature of this deck besides a couple individual cards? It's, there's no moving parts. To me, this is a very loud declaration that he really does want to shave. Sleeving up yeah. the most powerful deck. I think this is a, that's what it's all about now. Yeah, he's just itching all the time, signifying various food particles lodged in there, just, you know. There's only so long you can maintain a beer like that. Sleeping with that thing? Sleeping, yeah. It just, it can't be a pleasurable experience. Yeah. Driving and it hitting the steering wheel. Walking into a convenience store, the person running the cash register <laughs> might think that you're a crazy person, <laughs> stumbled in somehow. There's, you pay costs in a lot of places. I know he keeps it well maintained. He has told us that. Yeah. It's, it's definitely bushy, but it's not out of control. Yes, I agree. But... It's time. It's time for Chris to win it, an event. How does it actually work when you come into, like, a barber with that? That's just, whew. Yeah. That's just yeah. The, a task in and of itself. Yeah. Oh, so you decided that was the time. <laughs> yeah. I, guess it was the, I guess it was the 17th inch that finally <laughs> led you to believe that you should 
go and consult some some professional help in getting this groomed. What kind of tip do you give the barber who who trims that off I, yeah, and cleans I, it up for you? It's got to be a healthy one. Fortunately, I'm basically incapable of growing facial hair myself, so this is not a problem that I ever have to deal with. We'll take a look at the sideboards here. We're going to start with Joe Russells. He's going to be on the play. I've got that in front of me. He's got a Garrett Collar of Beast in his sideboard. Three in his main deck, one in his board. Two copies of Sylvan Primordial. That card's been getting a lot of play. Yeah, we've seen it. The past couple of weeks. It's been making a lot of cameo appearances in the Open Series lately. It's yeah. It's been nice. People really try to make fetch happen there. One copy of Nylea's Disciple, three Mist Cutter Hydra, three Storm Breath Dragon, three Mist Mortars, and two copies of Shock. Now, Shock is probably the most appealing here, so you can keep Pack Rat in control. But this might be a deck that actually tries to go over the top of Pack Rat and not care about the tokens. Yeah, I think you're actually more likely to see Mizzy and Mortarus make an appearance here than Shock. Shock's fairly narrow, and this deck is capable of overloading Mortars when it has Nykthos without much difficulty. So, uh, and, and Mortars is also a very good answer to Pack Rat, assuming you can do it fast enough. So, Shock's a little bit on the narrow side, and Mortars covers more stuff, and... Again, overloading is a very real angle this deck has access to. Stormbreath Dragon, not all that exciting. Same thing can be said about Miscutter Hydra, the Nylea's Disciple, you know, the, the additional Garrick I actually do kind of like because it is so powerful if it does resolve. And if things are going according to plan, you can actually cast that card on turn three or turn four. There's no guarantee of that. And then the Primordial is just an expensive threat. So not a lot of cards here, it seems like, for Russell to sideboard in against Mono Black. Chris, on the other hand, has some good action here. He has two copies of Doomblade and three Lifebane Zombies, where I'm close to 100% sure that he's going to bring those in. He also has two additional Farika's Cures, which not at their best here, but pinning the early mana and Burning Tree Emissaries is a valuable thing to be doing. In a lot of matchups, killing the Burning Tree Emissary doesn't matter for very much. It's just a 2-2 in play. It's no different than any other creature. But because it actually provides two devotion for Nykthos, and this deck is all about going off with Nykthos, mm -hmm. Every creature you kill is critical, even if it isn't a mana creature. So uh, depending on, you know, other stuff he wants to cut, maybe the matchup is too fast for Underworld Connections to make much of an impact. Maybe Devour Flesh isn't the most uh, reliable or efficient removal. I, I don't know if he can really find all the room, because Thoughtseize still seems good here, yeah. as a lot of Joe's hands are just one payoff card. But just any additional removal that is at all reliable is valuable, because you have to pin the mana and you have to keep the devotion count low. Well, we'll see how both players do opt to sideboard here as they are shuffling up for the second game in round number four. And, of course, if you guys are just joining us, Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, Star City Games Open Series here in Columbus, Ohio, home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. At SCG Live, hashtag SCGCOL for your tweets. We're taking questions all weekend long. We will have a mailbag or answer the reader set segment later today as we do make our way through our 10 rounds of standard action here in the Midwest. Always a fun time coming out to Ohio, one of the uh, hotbeds of magic. A lot of players here in attendance. As you said, it's kind of just eight hours away from everything. Yeah. And that, that game is also a really interesting case study on Mono Black 2. Where does it pick up a lot of its wins? Its draws just fail less often than everyone else's does. Yes. I think that's actually a huge deal. Your, your mana base is really stable. Almost all your lands come in to play untapped. And the type of games that Joe has there where he has a hand that's like pretty well set up, but he just needs red mana to get it going. And if he can keep his mana creatures in play, he can do some explosive stuff. His mana creatures got broken up. He didn't find red mana. Those kind of things don't happen to mono black. They're not trying to assemble different pieces of the puzzle. And with Underworld Connection, drawing your extra cards and Pack Rat discarding, Pack Rat to discard your bad draws, you also aren't at the mercy of your draw step as much as other decks are as well. Yeah, it feels like this deck gets to play magic more often than other decks. Like, you know, we saw in that last game, Russell. After his two Mana Accelerants were killed, he just didn't really get to do anything. He's going to try to get the Mana Accelerant started off this game with an Elvish Mystic, but we'll see what happens. Swamp the Boogeyman. Yep. So you see the hand here of Scar Guild Mage Pelucranos, a Sylvan Karyatid, and then two lands. And again, this is a situation where you can just really make the hand non-functional, and then if he's able to break up a piece, it might be a repeat of game one. Yep, and Van Meter has brought in Duress. I saw that in his opening hand, but nothing to Duress here, just creatures. See, so Scar Guildmage is going to take a look. You think you'd be familiar with the Guildmage because of Brad Nelson. His good buddy played that at Pro Tour Theros in the sideboard of his red green, kind of the, the first monsters deck, honestly, at that Pro Tour. I remember sitting down with Brad and just talking to him about the reason he was playing that card. And the fact, uh, one of the reasons, because Brad's been known to go deep, creatures you gain, creatures you control gain trample, you got to push through an Elspeth best somehow. Yeah, I actually tried to make this card happen in the three color humans deck from a season ago, too. Okay. Just an additional human. 
helps when you're flooding out, you know. Still triggers champion of the parish like any other human does. So I, I think this card's been a little underrepresented and constructed. I'm a fan. I feel like most of the guild mages have, honestly. Yeah. They had, haven't seen as much play as they did before. I remember the previous guild mage cycle that we saw in the beginning, Ravnica. You know, Selesnya guild mage and those guys. Those saw a lot of play. Well, hybrid mana versus an actual gold card are two very different things. That's very, very true. You can see an attack here for one. Her entry emissary shows up with Sylvan Curry to pass the turn back to the animator. He's already kind of under the gun here. Mm -hmm. now, this is a game where, you know, if he does have a turn two pack rat, might not be very good. Now, uh, Temple to see it on turn two is very unexciting. Looks like Nightfield Spectre is the card in question on the top of animator's deck. And Van Meter knows that that Burning Tree Emissary was chose draw last turn, so that Duress is still not really up to anything. Mm -hmm. See if he wants to keep the Spectre or not, analyzing his hand here. He's got a lot of swamps. He's definitely got the lands to cast the necessary spells. And this is kind of interesting because you see Hero's Downfall in Van Meter's hand. And, you know, Hero's Downfall is obviously a very, very good magic card, but, you know, how good is Hero's Downfall in this particular matchup where a lot... It's got a lot of targets. You know, you're kind of overworked. You know, you like to hear us downfall of Pelucranos or the Planeswalkers. You got a lot of things you have to kill with that thing. Arbor Colossus. So another Thought Seize allows Chris to take that Pelucranos, and now Joe with really would like to draw a Planeswalker this turn. And Domri, I think, would be the best draw on this deck, arguably. Xenagos, too, though. Xenagos would be excellent. Here's an attack for three. Going to put Van Meter down to 12. There's a Temple of Abandon, so we'll see what the Scry leads to. Russell, looks like he's going to put that one to the bottom. Maybe we've got to consult the one card that he does have in his hand. Thoughts he's causing the most problems this game here yep. for Russell. Surprise, surprise. Although, you know, the damage definitely matters that Chris is taking here. Russell really in the tank here over this Scry card in his hand, too. Very interesting. Makes me yeah. think of the new the new Xenagos. It seems like it would be really at home in this deck as well. You know, we think of it just going into Green Red Monsters, the deck that Van Meter and Bronduin played. It might be really good in this deck. Maybe, you know, uprooting that spot where Arbor Colossus is at. And it's going to just be another copy of Burning Tramissary and passing the turn, it looks like. Yeah, I'm curious what, what Joe was thinking about, because to me it feels like everything at this point is either a payout or a setup card. So, see if Van Meter had a Spectre in his hand already. Spectre would be the brick wall right now. The answer is no. So Russell's going to draw a card. He's going to come in for five immediately. So the Van Meter at twelve. This will put him down to seven. Van Meter's thumbing that hero's downfall, but all these cards are so anemic. Yeah, I, you know, this is a situation where I don't think he wants to cast Heroes Downfall, but he doesn't have much of a choice, so he's going to go down to nine. He's also trying to set up Desecration Demon, so everything matters. Yeah. All right, the Admeter going to take a draw. That's a Grey Merchant. He does have land number four, which will come into play untapped. Grey Merchant, a great draw for, for Chris here, as, you know, it allows him to recoup some of the life total and Grey Merchant's two for body very good against Joe's board right now. It would be very easy just to say, hey, just cast that Desecration Demon and get to work. But it looks like Chris has some other options, and he's going to cast a Duress. That's going to take a Garrick. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think given how long the Joe tanked, uh, if he didn't cast it, it had to be some sort of spell. All right, attack for three. Going to put Van Meter down to six. And that's a Domri. <laughs> you see, Chris. Ah, and now that's an Ilea, so that's going to go wow. to the hand, and that's going to be that's going to be live too. Yeah. Now there's not going to be enough mana to play it and pump something because that's going to require eight, but that's going to be a six six that's on the table now, and all of a sudden Van Meter's in some real trouble. This is going to take a draw here. And every creature is an enormous threat, and an indestructible creature is in play with Dalmry. Yeah. Which is a combo. Yep. That is a combo. Deck. That's a combination of cards right there. There you do see the god of the hunt with all the new gods coming out. We kind of forget about the old ones. And mm -hmm. this one hasn't seen as much play as some of the other ones, Thassa being the main offender. But it's still quite a good card. Yeah, and in, in Devotion lists, uh, I've seen one pretty frequently online, I feel like. And it's just another another enormous haymaker that you can find. You can also, it's also not six mana. I mean, you can deploy it pretty early on in the game. Yeah. 
And it is good with Domri, that's for sure. So let's see what Vandermeer wants to do this round. I think he's pricing it just casting the Grey Merchant, yeah. Because Desecration Demon is not going to do very much right now. And the window with Desecration Demon closes pretty quickly on how effective it can be. Mm -hmm. So it seems like that window has passed. Vandermeer is just going to play Grey Merchant and gain a little bit of life pass the turn back, but I'm not sure how good that's going to be in this situation. Russell draws his card. Doesn't look like it matters too much. is going to come into play. It's going to be active. is going to fight Grey Merchant. It's going to kill it, of course, as, it is, as it is a 6-6 indestructible. Here's an attack for three. Going to put Van Meter down to five. And how fast this game turned. I mean, Chris looked like, from my vantage point, that Desecration Demon plus uh, Grey Merchant was really going to solidify this game uh -huh. for him, but Domri and Annihilia just made his whole hand go to garbage. So now Van Meter looks at a hand of three cards, one of which is Devour Flesh, which couldn't be much worse right now. And he is going to concede the game. So Joe Russell, with some timely top decks, does win this game over Chris Van Meter. Grinner Devotion is going to tie it up over Mono Black. And you know the thing they say about discard spells? You can't stop the top of the deck. No, nope. and Chris, you know, didn't really put Joe under the gun at all. So Joe had quite a few draw steps to, to find what he was looking for. And that one Nylia was awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's just the one up in Russell's deck. And you don't see a lot of people play this card in Green Red Devotion. You know, there are other cards they play. Sometimes you see one, sometimes you see two. Um, but the reason they do play one is because there are certain games and board states where it's quite good, and this is definitely one of them. Yeah, it's another thing that is, you know, it, it has an interesting role where it's a card that's not a lot of mana to get into play. Four mana is reasonable to cast. Mm -hmm. It's also reasonable in some honest games because attacking and blocking is happening and can make that a little more complicated for your opponent. It's also a powerful payout for Nykthos as well. When you have a lot of mana, then the Nylia is especially good. And it, whenever Nylia gets turned on, which is, you know, correlates a lot to the spots where you have Nykthos and a lot of mana, then it's an enormous threat. So it's another Nykthos payout that isn't just dead in your hand until you find Nykthos. Something like Garrick, you kind of have to have Nykthos going, or the game has to be going on for a ton of turns before that can play a role. But Nylia can make an impact a little bit earlier. So you see Van Meter going back to the sideboard here. Looks like he changes some things up since he's going to be on the draw this go around. Russell, excuse me, he's gonna be on the play. I take that back, as Russell did win that second game. So Van Meter wants to change things up being on the play. Maybe we see more, more pack rats in or something that they should try to steal a quick one here. I wonder what he sideboarded out, though. It looks like he took out... It looks like he's putting connections back in, if I'm not mistaken. Second time we've seen this. I'll Todd Anderson do it a little bit earlier, too. Oh, no, never mind. It looks like he's putting back connections. Okay. Okay. Maybe he was doing something with his duresses. I'm not sure. I do like bringing duress in in this matchup. A lot of Planeswalkers to target. Garrick, Xenagos, and the Domri, in addition to spells that could come in here. Again, we talked about Mortars, possibly Shock as well. There are a lot of targets for Duress here. Mm -hmm. See, the Bearded One wants to make sure that he has a configuration that he likes for this third game. Off to a nice start. And, you know, that, that's something that we see from Van Meter a lot when we come to these tournaments. He's always getting off to a really nice start. Um, and when you're in a 10-round tournament, you know, obviously you don't want to lose any round, but you don't want to start the day off with a loss. It can really just kind of slow your morale down. But getting off to a couple of wins really just gets the day started off right. In Indianapolis, he was off to a great start, I believe 5-0 and 6-0 mm -hmm. in the tournament before taking a couple of losses towards the end of the Swiss rounds. I know that when I, you know, I, I play in PTQs or, you know, different tournaments, it's pretty important for me to get get my tournament off started with a win or two wins. Just kind of get me in the zone and get me going, stuff like that. You know, starting off a tournament one and one just kind of a kind of a bummer. Almost makes you just want to go home, which I know is kind of your move. Oh, yeah. Just call it quits a little early. The one oh drop. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. you're almost infamous for the one one. Ah, I've had enough. I'm done. Yeah, I don't want to see any more spell skites today, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mulligan to six? Ah, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mono Black versus Green Red. We haven't seen Grand Devotion in a long time. I wonder if this is a deck that if it gets a new tool, it comes back. Because, again, after Pro Tour Theros with Mahara making the top of this deck, this deck really picked up like wildfire, but it didn't really put the results forward that people were expecting. 
And it's this deck that when it does win, it sure does do it in a flashy manner with those Planeswalkers and all the mana can generate. But when it loses, it's a, it leaves a pretty bad taste in your mouth of just, I didn't get to do anything. My opponent just kind of crushed me and broke up my devotion. And they can never beat me when everything's going right. But if they stop things going right, I can't win. You know, maybe this deck gets a new tool in the next set. Yeah, it's possible. And maybe Xenagos is that card too. I mean, that, that, that feels right at home here, potentially. Definitely something to ramp into. But I don't know if it needs more things to ramp into if it just needs another mana accelerant. That's kind of the question. But then do you want to play 16 mana accelerants? Because that's a lot when you've already got Mystic, Voyaging Seder, and Sylvan Karyatid, so. Yeah, it, it, the deck just has a lot of moving parts. And the first game that you saw, Joe, you know, the mana creatures got killed, you didn't find red mana. Those feel like pretty stereotypical green-red devotion losses. I know we talked about really briefly just, you know, a player starting off with a loss and how it can, you know, kind of defeat them morale. I see Dan Cato walking around the room. Uh, when we were in Indianapolis, he started 0-1 and then didn't lose anymore until the top four. But he is, uh, he's here probably piloting red-green monsters again. You see Russell's going to take a mulligan. Yeah, a lot of perseverance. I was there once upon a time. You got to battle back. It's, I, I have a... Uh, I've top eight at a PTQ or two after starting 0 1, but it's like this it's like this feeling where it's like when you lose, it's just like someone beat me so I can go home. Just someone end my tournament. But I remember one player who I remember has won multiple PTQs after starting 0 1 is Adam Yurchik. Yep. Um, and I learned a lot from Adam in my magic career about, you know, the one thing I learned about from him is playing to win. But the, the other big one was just, you know, when you start a tournament with a loss, it just, or, you know, you lose early tournament, it just doesn't matter. You know, you might as well get the, you have to get the loss out of the way at some point. It doesn't really matter when. And I remember multiple PTQs, especially one where he was playing the Icarid deck um, at a PTQ, where he started 0-1 losing the mirror, and he was just like, yeah, I'm not losing anymore. This deck's way too good. And I ended up taking the invite home. Yeah, there's a lot of players who see the tournament as there's this large narrative, and they start thinking about, I need to go X or X1 for the next four rounds, and I can draw in, all that kind of stuff. And then there's other players who can just... Just view every round as its own isolated event. You yeah. don't think about the larger narrative of the tournament. I think that you're, the more that you're in the first camp, the more that the, that round one or round two loss feels like a disaster. And the more that you're in the second camp, the more it's just, you know, okay, well, now I go play round two. I try to win that one. Yeah. It's hard to put yourself in the second camp. I, I think, you know, sometimes you're looking at the overall picture of just like you want to win the tournament, and so I have to accomplish X amount of wins to do so, where some people can just go, all right, well, that was a round ago, and I'll move on to the next round. Ah, yes, thought sees when the opponent mulligans. <laughs> you see a temple of abandon, a mountain, along with the Xenagos. Very good six card hand. Yeah, Voyaging Seder and a Burning Transmitter. I, I would assume, or at least predict, I think assume is the wrong word. We might see Voyaging Seder bite the dust here. It feels either Voyaging Seder or Xenagos. The accelerant or the thing he's trying to accelerate into. Of course, depends on the contents of Van Meter's hand, but we'll see what he does select. Looks like he's got a Farikas Cure in the grip. So he does have an answer for that Voyaging Seder. Yeah, it looks like his hand's really flush with just good, efficient answers. A Farikas Cure, a Life Bane Zombie. You might just see him take Xenagos here and go to work on all the creatures. Use a removal spell on turn two, a Life Bane Zombie on turn three. And as powerful as Thoughtseize is, it becomes more powerful when you select the right card. Which is a very, you know, simple thing to say. But if you select the wrong card with Thoughtseize after you had all the information, and then lose because of it, you know, that's that's your own fault, and realistically. The, yeah, and on the other side of this, you see Thoughtseize is so much more powerful against decks that are trying to mix and match cards together rather than just playing linear strategy. Joe's, Joe's deck is very susceptible to having his hand picked apart yeah. because he has, you know, maybe one mana accelerate in some hands, maybe he only has one real powerful card he's trying to ramp to, and picking apart those kind of decks is quite powerful. Burning Tree Emissaries' selection there with Thoughtseize. Temple of Abandon is going to come into play for Russell. His draw step was a Garrett Collar of Beasts, so we're a long way away from casting that. As the Scry does resolve, and Manimir is going to untap that swamp. He'll take a draw. It is another swamp, which is important for him because he's a little bit land light. He can pass the turn back here to Russell. Russell's going to play that mountain. The Voyaging Seder is going to come into play, but it won't last very long. Freakus here is going to take that down. Van Meter is going to go back up to his original 20. He'll untap quickly, he'll take a draw, and that's going to be a life bane zombie. And this is just such an efficient curve here that you're seeing from Chris. And now Joe just stranded with some pretty expensive 
not particularly efficient planeswalkers that he can't even cast with the amount of mana he has in his hand. And even Xenagos now is kind of brick wall too, right? Because the zombie can just take care of that with an attack. If Xenagos comes in and just pluses, it's like it didn't even come into play at all. Mm -hmm. So Russell's just going to play his forest. In comes the life being zombie, the M14 rare. One of Brian Kibler's least favorite cards is a Desecration Demon is going to come into play. And as you mentioned, you know, this is kind of the difference between Mono Black and a lot of other decks is the fact that more often than not, it gets to play magic. This is Joe's second game of this match where he doesn't really get to play magic. But that's also predicated on the fact that Mono Black is such a powerful deck. Well, there's, you know, the first game Joe was missing red mana and had his creatures killed. So that's not playing magic in a in one way. That's your kind of conventional color screw and lose. This is a little bit different where the thought seize was an integral part of Joe not getting to assemble all of his parts. And now we see Desecration Demon out there doing its thing. Can't sacrifice the Mystic, needs it for mana. So an attack here for, for excuse me, for nine. I was going to say seven, but it's nine. They're going to put Russell down to eight. And, you know, one of the things about Mono Black, too, is that it is kind of this mid range deck that can play a lot of roles, but its closing speed is pretty crazy, too. Hero's Downfall going to take care of the Elvish Mystic. Cuts him off of mana. And in any event, the Hero's Downfall is probably just going to do, just prevent Joe from stopping Desecration Demon on one mm -hmm. turn. So you might as well do it now, cut him off of mana. See a land on here for Russell. Yeah, you know, Xenagos does do a nice job of slowing down Desecration Demon. But again, Life Bane Zombie can just take care of Xenagos after that one turn of slowing down the Desecration Demon. And heaven forbid, Van Meter draws a removal spell for the token that I believe Joe is about to make. Yeah, this is this is Joe just getting a pass through this turn, basically. Yeah. And he does at least get to two, get two free points of damage. So Van nice. Meter's going to go down to 18. <laughs> <laughs> Real it's, nice. It's a moral victory. Van Meter's going to draw a card. Trigger goes on. That's, of course, going to sacrifice here to the demon. Take care of the Zen. It goes to the Life Bane Zombie. Follow-up play here. Is, oh, everybody's favorite. A little yeah. salt in the eye with a pack rat with three mana available to make another rat here as Russell's going to draw a card. And not even Bonfire the Damned can save him. And Bonfire can get people out of most every situation. Yeah. When you're in can't-draw-Bonfire world... He will fight on. He's going to play a Burning Tree Emissary. Mana from that's going to allow him to cast up Lucranos. So he can sack the Burning Tree Emissary to tap the... And his pack rats are going to be 3-3s three when they attack, so... Yeah, because he gets I to... Suppose yeah, he, gets he survives this turn, but... but does he? Because he sacrifices Emissary to the Demon, and then he attacks. Okay, yeah, I guess he gets to play another turn. It's not over just yet. To the extent that he was playing any of these turns, he gets to play another turn. Yes. See how Van Meter wants to attack. He's just going to get in there with everybody. So going to get in front here, discard this, make another one. So it's going to be attack for three, six, going to put Russell down to two. Does lose the pack rat. Too many angles of attack right now because of the demon in the air. Yep. The demon in the air and the unblockable life bane zombie is just too much. I was trying to think if maybe if he drew a plummet, would it get him back in the situation of being able to kill the demon and the no standing tall? But the answer is no, and Joe Russell will extend the hand. So Chris Van Meter off to a beautiful start. Number five on our leaderboard moves on to 4-0, and one step closer, as we have said many times, to being able to shave.